Well, hi there and welcome. Good to have you here for this webcast. Jonathan Faust here. Um, and we've got in store uh, a little welcome, a little live meditation, and then an archive talk. One of the talks I really enjoyed putting together on the best technique. Like what is the best technique? So before we dive into that, some thank yous to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo, the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this. Um, shout out to my friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Arlington in Arlington, Virginia, which now offers live classes. And let's see. Well, there's always our Mindful Movement leader. Thank you so much, uh, Rita, for offering Mindful Movement before this session. And also a big thank you to Ray, Ray Maniocchi for leading the Mindful Dialogue after the talk. You can get those links at my website on my Facebook page. Hmm, what else? Thank you for your support. Uh, this is all offered freely and anything you can offer to help make this happen to ensure that there's no charge uh, to uh, get access to these practices and teachings. Thank you for that. So I think that's it. Let's just close our eyes and get started on this meditation. If you like, you might you might actually like to close your eyes and and just check in with your body. How might your body want to move? Are there any little gross deep-seated tensions that you want to work out? Maybe reaching the arms up overhead, stretching a little bit from side to side, deepening your breath. And then as you're ready, let your body begin to settle in. And I always like to take a few moments to acknowledge this transition from awareness focused externally to awareness focused a little more internally. And one very powerful way to do this is to notice right now where you feel the breath the most predominant on the inside. You may notice in this turning inward that there can be sometimes even just a momentary sense of calming, a sense of arriving. I'll share with you one of my favorite techniques for dropping inward. And that is to lengthen your inhalation. And on the exhalation, just let the breath fall out of your body. You, you might even do it through an open mouth, breathing in. And then if you like, let's do this five times. And on each exhalation, how much more can you relax and soften on the out-breath? You may notice this inner sense of receptivity, a heightened awareness of feeling. And you might, if you like, explore that a little bit deeper, relaxing, if you can, the muscles around your eyes, feeling your forehead smooth. And now if you relax your jaw, let your jaw just kind of hang from the skull, feel the inside of the mouth, feel the weight of the tongue, and over the next three breaths, notice how much more you can allow all expression to melt away from your face. Face expressionless. And feel the weight of your arms from the inside out, down through the elbows, and down through the wrists. 
Can you feel or imagine the space, the volume of your hands, fingers, and thumbs? Is it possible to soften or relax your belly? Feel the weight, the volume of your legs from the inside out, from the hips to the knees. The knees through the ankles. And tops of the feet and the toes. And the soles of the feet and the heels. And from the crown of the head down through the soles of the feet, you might explore the following question. Is there anything inside right now that could relax or soften or let go? And from this inquiry into deep relaxation, you might introduce an anchor. And perhaps the movement of the breath, maybe the sounds around you, maybe the feeling in the palms. And sense, if you can, for these next few minutes to explore what it's like to cultivate a sense of deep relaxation. And at the same time, this very gentle focus on the feeling on the inside here at the breath or the vibration of sound or the feeling in the palms. The mind, of course, will naturally come up with a narrative and commentary. But when you notice that, just come back, relax, and sense if you can receive the moment right here at the point of contact. The mind has wandered. Allow yourself to feel some pleasure in the return. What could relax or soften? You might touch into some pleasant sensations inside as you relax. And then very gently re-arrive, bringing your attention to the breath or sound or feeling in the palms. Receiving the moment right here at this point of contact with your anchor.
is it possible to sense at the same time this quality of what some call mindfulness, what some might call non-judging awareness, the capacity to observe what's happening just as it is. And you might now, in these remaining minutes, expand your attention beyond your anchor to notice everything that's changing 360 degrees. Noting this quality of deep relaxation, this quality of attentiveness to the here and now, and also this quality of allowing, of letting things be, letting things change just as they naturally are happening. There's a quality of effort in this practice. When you notice the mind wandering, you bring it back to the here and now. There's also a quality of allowing, of letting things be. And you might explore in these remaining few minutes, letting the practice of doing fall away and explore more this sense of just simply resting in presence letting the anchor fall away. Is it possible to relax and allow even more? Is it possible to relax and allow even more than that? And you might find it helpful over the next three exhalations. How much more could you soften inside and track any inner shift of being resting in presence? And you might very gently now begin to deepen your breath, sensing the sounds around you, quality of presence. And beginning your transition, let your body move and shift in any way that feels good for you. As you're ready, there's no hurry, you can open your eyes. And welcome. An age-old question, been around for a long, long time. When it comes to meditation, what's the best technique? Out of all the techniques, what's the very best? Well, this talk is going to tell you. <laughs> I hope you enjoy. Great to be with you.
Last night I gave this talk called The Best Technique in Arlington, Virginia. And while I was giving the talk, I thought, hey, this is a pretty good talk. And unfortunately, it wasn't recorded. So it's the next day. I'm sitting here with a glass of iced coffee, and I'm hoping to recreate the talk. I just spent nine days at the Kripalu Center in Western Massachusetts leading a program called Guiding Meditation for Transformational Yoga Teaching. Kripalu was my literally my home for 20-some years, and it was nice to be back, nice to be with such sincere practitioners looking to explore all the different techniques that support people in their meditation practice and in the intention to become more awake and more alive. So I was driving back, and just before I kind of hit Maryland, I think, there was an interview on Sirius XM Radio with a teacher in a particular tradition of meditation. And basically, this teacher was either saying or implying that that the technique he had been teaching all these years was the best. He would say, it's effortless, the research is in, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know if I want to actually name the, the, the style of meditation, but it does rhyme with schmanzendental meditation. Now, I am very, very grateful to the whole transcendental meditation movement. When I was 15, I just happened to stumble into the technique. And from my very first experience of doing mantra meditation, I had a very deep sense, really kind of a knowing that I would be doing this for the rest of my life. It had such a profound effect on my 15-year-old brain. I found myself more creative, more confident, more relaxed, less reactive, more responsive, really quite miraculous. And fortunately, I found some like-minded people and it kept a consistent practice all the way through high school and then all the way through college. In fact, I co-managed a thousand-acre farm and Oftentimes, we would be doing our plowing in the spring, and we'd all take a break and hop into a pickup truck and drive to the corner of a field and sit for 20 minutes and then go back to our respective machines. I was reminded of that because I arrived early for class and uh, sat and meditated in my car for a while. I've done a lot of meditation in vehicles over the course of my life. So... The question is, what is the best practice? That's what I'd like to explore tonight. And I'm still not sure when I'm going to do the big reveal, but probably toward the end. What I would like to talk about are really four things. First is how important intention is whenever you engage into any practice that's designed to bring you more alive and more awake. There are certain practices and techniques that are related to the intention to awaken present moment awareness practices and techniques that are related to the intention to see clearly. And there are practices that are related to opening the heart, the compassion practices. And finally, the techniques that are related to opening to the mystery, of surrendering to reality itself. So the first question really becomes, what is your intention? Why are you engaging into a practice? One of my dear friends on the planet is a retired Mountie, and he got trained in teaching Bikram yoga. And as he was stepping into his teaching, he was telling me that in Ottawa, at some point, there was a waiting list for his classes. Now, Bikram yoga, if you're not familiar with it, is a very rigorous form of yoga. It's, I believe, 28 postures, two times in a room heated to approximately 110 degrees. I can understand why, how living in Ottawa, you would really enjoy being in a room heated to 110 degrees. But nonetheless, there were still uh, quite a lineup. And I asked him why, you know, in this day when so many yoga teachers are looking for students, does he have a wait list? And, And he said kind of nonchalantly, um, Bikram buns. And if you're not familiar with Bikram buns, it's that, it's that tight little yoga butt. So there's an intention. We're all drawn to practice, and it might be the practice to get more healthy, to tighten up your butt. It might be to reduce stress. It might be 
to really sincerely open up to your true purpose in life or to see into the nature of reality. There are many, many different doorways. And I've noticed that there, oftentimes there are people who are drawn to spiritual practice who have had a fair degree of success in their life. Enough to, to sense that achieving their goals did not create long-term happiness. And there's a sense of wanting to know what's, what's transcendent of that. Where, where does deeper happiness come from? And then there are those who, who enter into the practice through pain, through intense suffering, through either physical suffering or difficult emotions or strong mental states, a sense of really feeling, feeling broken by life and looking for the practices and the techniques that help to, to create more wholeness. So the question is, what has drawn you to practice? What has drawn you to prioritize slowing down and paying deep attention. You know, not that long ago, if you wanted to explore transformational practices or any sort of real self-development technique, you studied with who was right there in your village. That, that was it. That was, avail- that was what was available. And for me, transcendental meditation was my village. When I learned Transcendental Meditation, I practiced it quite intensely and rigorously for about 15 years before I moved into an ashram. And for many years, I didn't know there was any other meditation technique. I thought I was doing meditation. And I was doing meditation, but I did not realize there were so many different varieties and techniques. What I find so amazing now is through the Internet that there are so many teachings available, so many truly secret teachings that are now there for a PDF download. And it can be quite confusing because there are so many different traditions, so many teachers who are happy to inform you that the technique that they're offering is the best technique. In some meditation traditions, they say, this is the technique by which the Buddha gained his enlightenment. Why would you practice any other? Some forms of yoga where it is presented, all other variations of yoga come from this tradition. Why would you practice any other technique? This is the best and highest tradition. So I think it's important to to try different techniques and to explore what really works for you. And that's what we're going to be diving into. So when you reflect on intention, there there is an intention, perhaps, to awaken to present moment awareness. And so you undertake the training to cultivate concentration and sustained attention to whatever your anchor may be. It may be a a physical anchor in sensation. It might be more of a mental anchor, as in mantra meditation. You're returning back to a sound or a thought. In Christian contemplative prayer, that's so beautifully articulated by, among others, Father Thomas Keating, as you reflect on a word or a phrase from Scripture that's meaningful for you, and that is what you return to, to not just that word, but to the kind of the feeling that it invokes. It's essentially mantra meditation, but still very, very powerful. When you cultivate sustained present moment awareness, particularly on sensation, just to speak to that, there are deeper and deeper levels of concentration and different states of consciousness that you find yourself moving into. The jhanas are described as these excess concentration states, and they can be enormously, enormously powerful. They certainly have in my practice. On a month-long retreat, I noticed myself over time, after about three weeks, beginning to really settle into quiet. And I would find that when I would reflect on, on sensations, particularly when I would sort of open my heart into sort of a compassionate, gratitude sort of space, that there would be this sort of rush of of pleasantness that would overcome me. And this is the first jhana or the the first sort of state of, of concentration where 
there's, there's sort of an upwelling. Uh, sometimes it's described as a, a sense of rapture. And in practicing these techniques, you sort of shift from the anchor of the senses to, to the state itself. And as you reflect on, on this pleasantness, this sort of upwelling of joy, really, you begin to sense that it's somewhat fragile. So you begin to explore well, what is it that's more stable beneath just these pure sensations. And there your attention can sort of stabilize in a quality of joy. And, and, and sort of at first blush for myself, I thought, this is it, I've arrived. Um, but then you begin to see that, that this state of joy is also somewhat dependent on causes and conditions. And you then sense, what is it that's more stable than this? And then that can guide you to a sense of contentment, which has sort of a, a broader, a, a richer quality to it than joy, which can be somewhat ephemeral. And as the practice continues, you then sense what is it that is more stable than this state. And you find there's a kind of an, a, a deep, utter sense of peacefulness that's sort of transcendent to contentment. You begin to sense the infinity of space. And as you progress, the, the infinity of consciousness. And as the jhanas continue to sort of deepen and widen and become more transcendent, it's harder and harder to find words to describe them because they're, they're so deeply experiential and so beyond words. But there is a quality of, of a sense of an, of no thingness, of a kind of an emptiness of any permanent nature whatsoever. One state is described as neither perception nor non-perception. Just this, this experience of something very, very hard to describe. <laughs> and then there is the, the state of what's called cessation, which externally can look almost like, like deep sleep, but a state of deep, deep wakefulness. No doubt you have experienced some of these states at different times in your practice. Certainly the, the, the deep, deep, rich, pleasant sensation, the, the joy, the contentment, the peacefulness, perhaps at moments of sensing the, the infinity of space and consciousness. These states can be accessed through sustaining present moment awareness, relaxing and paying deeper and deeper attention. You might just take a, a minute to, to reflect on this. If you like, you can close your eyes and let your attention move to one of the senses, either the, the breath or the sound vibrations, maybe the felt sense in the hands. And just for the next minute, let your attention rest there and sense if it's possible to sustain moment-to-moment -moment attention to the experience right here at the anchor. Concentration can be an incredible tool to awaken to present moment attention. Concentration is necessary to be successful in your life, to be able to, to sustain attention on something you want to create, to penetrate into the direct perception of reality. Concentration is important. It gathers your attention so you can sustain through the waves and modifications of the mind and moods and everything that changes. When you look at a film, a modern film, it's 24 frames per second. So every second there are 24 still images that are passing in front of a light. It looks like motion but it's actually still images strung together fast enough to create the illusion of movement. 
And what if it's the same thing with consciousness, that the moment is blinking on and off and so fast that we can sustain a narrative of flowing time? When you begin to slow down and deeply, deeply concentrate, you can begin to sense how many noticings there is per second. Daniel Ingram, in his book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, talks about concentration practice with kind of a a goal or a suggestion of 10 notings per moment, noticings per moment, or I guess per second. That seemed like too much for me when I last did some intensive practice. I thought, what about three? Can I do three noticings per second? It's a fascinating way to explore concentration and consciousness. Whatever you are drawn to in practice, this present moment sustained attention is very, very important. When you are more aware, you see more. You are less reactive, more responsive. You sense patterns in yourself and in others, and there's so much mastery that comes out of your capacity to slow down and be deeply, deeply present like Neo in The Matrix, who could dodge bullets, there's a different relationship to time that can occur. I'm not guaranteeing uh, you'll be dodging any bullets anytime soon, but there is something about your relationship to time and developing the sense of concentration. So there's also an intention in spiritual practice to see clearly. As I had the good fortune to be with professional-level yoga teachers who had poured a lot of their attention into developing their skill and their craft, we spent many hours in practice and exploring different techniques. While concentration is very, very important, at the same time, concentration is not a liberation practice. It brings you deeply into the experience of here and now. But as you develop your capacity for self-observation without criticism, your capacity to witness what is changing, therein lies the possibility of becoming more free where you were not free before. It's just a little story. One woman was sharing how she was in the middle of our of our intensive practice and was sort of overcome with a panic attack where she thought, I, I can't teach this. There, there's no way I, I can successfully teach these techniques. And she had enough of the witness, enough of the sense of self-observation to, to sort of pause and look at that belief. And it occurred to her, what if that belief isn't true? I mean, where did that fundamental belief come from? And she could pretty instantly sense it as part of the narrative of her mother, constantly questioning her ability to do anything. And so she reflected on who she was without that belief. What if it's not true? And experienced a big rush of possibility and creativity. And while that's just a brief example, your capacity for self-observation can lead you to a really beautiful sense of, of freedom. So you might just take a moment to draw in this sense of concentration, come back to the anchor, the breath, or sound, or felt sense. And then in your own way, just sense foreground and background. Can you sense the anchor in the foreground and in the background, a sense of everything that is moving and shifting and changing? And now can you sense who you are or what this observer is. What is this which is aware? We bring into our life, we bring into our practice an intention to see clearly. There is something inside that 
wants to see what is true. And so you begin to study the self. You begin to look closely at what is happening in your relationship to it. What is this experience of life in a body? These impulses that carry you from day to day, where do they come from? Your desires and dreams that that motivate you. Your fears and your anxieties, what are they all about? This is part of the liberation practice. The capacity to observe the causes and conditions as the observer and to sense where you are bound by by greed and desire, where you are bound by, by fear, hatred and ill will, and where you are bound by, by confusion and delusion. In yoga, we speak a lot of the witness, the sense of who you are as the knower or the observer. And cultivating this can be quite healthy. There is a shadow side, of course, to anything. Everything has two, two sides to every coin. The near enemy of cultivating the sense of witness or the observer can be kind of a disassociation or a quality of indifference. But, but a healthy witness gives you enough distance to, to study not just what is arising in your experience, but your relationship to it. You begin to see more clearly into the, the fact of change, that everything born of causes and conditions is subject to change. You begin to observe through this lens of self-observation how your relationship to what is changing directly impacts the degree to which you'll experience stress, dissatisfaction, unsteadiness, or suffering. And you begin to see as well into the nature of the self, that there are aspects of of who you are that are subject to change, the physical body, which will change and fall away, your thoughts and emotions, the narrative of your life, subject to change. And the inquiry becomes, who are you beyond causes and conditions? What is that quality of unconditioned consciousness? And so with the intention to see clearly, you bring yourself present. You become a student of the self, a student of reality, and you begin to see into the nature of things. Another intention we bring forward in spiritual practice that leads to different techniques is the training of the heart. There are specific techniques that are designed to cultivate a greater sense of our interconnectedness to heal our wounds. One of the most direct paths is reflecting on gratitude. When you turn your attention to just one thing that you are most grateful for, you may feel a shift inside, a quality of receptivity, a a quality of inner presence. And certainly turning your attention to what is incomplete, what needs to be forgiven, is a direct path. With the recent murders in Charleston, I feel that a huge part of our our cultural healing is the amazing public act of forgiveness by the community. There is something about that act of conscious forgiveness that, in my sense, could not help but touch everyone who was exposed to that. It awakened a sense of our interconnectedness. 
And the fact that the memorial services were held in a basketball arena and, and that they were jammed, it truly touched my heart. There's a broad sense of, of healing and openness that we have to do. But this practice of compassion and forgiveness and gratitude is personal as well. This last weekend, when I was at Kripalu Center in Western Massachusetts, Harville Hendricks was delivering um, a weekend program there. If you're not familiar with him, um, he wrote a best-selling book called Getting the Love You Want. And that was followed by a second book called Keeping the Love You Have. And one of my standard jokes is that I'm waiting for his third book, and I'm anticipating the title will be Dumping the Schmuck You've Got. That may take some time before that one's out. But Harville Hendricks famously said that romantic love is the anesthesia that brings two incompatible people together for the purpose of healing. So there were probably a hundred couples here at the at Kripalu Center, and it was fascinating to watch them in the process, all in different states of connectedness or disconnection in their relationships. Certainly, I, I've, I've led intensive relationship programs there, and I know that approximately 40% of them were dragged there against their will or coerced. But over time, I could see by the end of the weekend, through owning their feelings, practicing empathy, seeing the self in other and the other in self, there was a softening in these, in these couples. So we all have our personal work to do, to take responsibility for what feels unhealed, what what bitterness we hold. When we find ourselves with a closed heart and bound by the pain and the suffering of our hurts and betrayals, as the Buddha said, whenever you are angry or wish to do harm to another, it's like picking up a hot coal that you want to throw at the other person without realizing that you are the one who's being burned by that hot coal. So it can be helpful to reflect what is incomplete in your heart. What needs to be forgiven? What's between you and feeling peace in your heart? And so there are techniques. There is the whole realm of the devotional practices of bhakti yoga. And for those who are naturally devotional, it's a very powerful direct path, whether it be a tradition to a teacher, something to which you can open your heart, open your awareness. That can be tremendously, tremendously powerful. Some of us are more inclined in that direction. In the ashram where I lived for a few decades, it was a very devotional community. And while it wasn't quite my style, there was something very, very sweet about it. We did a practice called arti every night, which is kind of an an offering of light, offering the fruit of our practice to ourselves and out to the world. And pretty much every night, I participated in this ceremony of lights. And there was something quite beautiful about this devotional aspect. In Buddhism, there is the practice of metta, the the cultivation of friendliness. The word metta has as its root the word mita, which means friend. So it's cultivating a sense of of friendship toward ourselves and toward others. The practice of metta expands into the practice of conscious forgiveness, the releasing of ourselves for our our ignorance and the pain that we might cause others consciously or unconsciously through our thoughts or speech or actions, consciously reflecting on offering forgiveness to those who have harmed us. When we can do these practices that cleanse the heart, we feel more alive, more awake, with more of a sense of our our profound interconnectedness. 
another training we can undertake, another intention is to intend to more rapidly and easily open to the mystery of life, to surrender into life itself. For myself, from an early age, and certainly reinforced through my intensive practice of yoga and meditation and being able to live in an ashram where so many teachers came through, offering so many different techniques and trainings and traditions, I realized a number of years ago that much of my spiritual practice has been about chasing lights and rainbows, gunning for some mystical experience that was going to finally explain it all to me. And I have had some amazing experiences in my life. When I first moved into the Kripalu Yoga Ashram, the, the, the guru was doing practicing something called Shaktipat, which was going into deep meditation with chanting that could invoke a really exquisite, exquisite, powerful kriyas or purifications. And meditating those first years in the ashram were simply extraordinary to experience the, the light and radiance in yoga and meditation, to, to touch into that deep, deep steadiness, to be able to sustain attention in, in those jhana states, to, to feel bliss, the bliss of, of emptiness and cognizance, and to sense these deep, deep characteristics, characteristics of reality through my practice, absolutely extraordinary wonderful, informative experiences. And I have come to see that it's less and less about chasing those states and more and more about surrendering into what is. As the saying goes, it's more about letting life happen than making life happen. But in practice, we find that effort is required cultivating and sustaining moment-to-moment, present-moment awareness is very, very important. Practicing the techniques that allow you to observe without judgment, integral, very, very important. Opening the heart, cleansing the heart, very important. And developing your capacity to allow, to let it be, also very, very important. I was recently with a dear friend of mine who is uh, a, quite a depth practitioner. And he said something that in, has informed my practice recently. And he said that in, in his experience, his sense is that enlightenment, if you will, is simply a state of no desire. That has resonated for me. What does that mean to, to have no desire? And what I find is in the moment, experientially, when even when I reflect on that, there is a sense of receiving what is here. The more I can suspend desire, the more I can actually contact and welcome what is already here. And this is an integral part of this practice of opening to the mystery. All these different techniques, all these different traditions, ultimately, I think, where they lead us is recognizing that life itself is a pathless path. Ultimately, no matter what the technique or what the tradition, it comes down to two questions. What is happening right now? And how does this moment want you to be with it? When you ask these questions, it then opens you to develop skillful means. If you're too scattered, over-emotional, perhaps you want to tighten it up. Some concentration practice, sustain attention in the here and now. 
If you're too tight, too bound up, loosen up. What if, you're, if, what if you were to relax? Find some way to open to appreciate the flow of life happening through you. As you are aware of some form of bitterness in your heart, some sense of separation between you and another, can you pause and investigate that and sense if you can find inner balance? There is a story of someone who wandered the planet trying different techniques and interviewing meditation masters, asking what is the best technique after all that I have done and tried I don't want to waste any more time so he asked this meditation master please tell me what is the best technique a teacher looked deeply in his eyes and said the best technique is the one you do on a regular basis sorry for that zen punchline uh, which it had wish it had a little more drama to it but whatever you do on a regular basis will bring your attention to the here and now inevitably it will guide you toward asking what is happening right now how does this want me to be with it and no matter where you start in your practice inevitably there is a wisdom faculty that arises. Who you are as the knower of your experience. And inevitably, you will be inspired to develop more skillful means. To recognize that all these techniques, the techniques that help you to sustain present moment awareness, the techniques that allow you to take this stance of the witness or the observer, to see clearly into the characteristics of reality that anything born of causes and conditions is subject to change. That how you hold your experience internally depends, has direct impact on the degree to which you will feel stress or suffering. And to look deeply into the nature of the self, of who you are as awareness. To develop your capacity to cleanse the heart to open to the infinite realms of kindness and compassion and joy and equanimity. To learn how to train yourself to shift from doing to being and to allowing. All of these skillful means come with practice. Studying reality, studying the self, can lead to two essential qualities. One of them is wisdom, to see what is true, transcendent of your preference, your story, your narrative. The second is this realm of compassion, the capacity to hold your experience, no matter what it is, to be with it, to let it flow. Let's take a few minutes to reflect on these techniques. You might for a moment bring your attention to one anchor, a breath, or sound, or the felt sense in the hands. Let yourself fully land here in the here and now, sustaining present moment attention. Can you sense who you are as the observer? Can you sense this quality of foreground and background and awareness of everything that's changing and moving and shifting in your experience? Is it possible to, at the same time, open to some sense of kindness or compassion or empathy? If you were to hold your experience right now with some quality of loving presence, with gratitude or appreciation, how does that shift? How does that move?
And is it possible in these final moments to, to hold all of this in an appreciation of the mystery? Of simply allowing it to be, allowing it to flow. I'd like to close with a, a reading from Da John, one of my favorites that speaks about what it means to embrace the mystery. And this little speech was delivered to some of the youngest children in their spiritual community. So you may, might imagine this speaking directly to your inner two-year-old. Nobody, not mom or dad or grandmother or grandfather or big sister or big brother or teachers or doctors or soldiers or reverends or athletes or lawyers or TV stars or any people who are working, or any people who are playing, not even the president, not even a king or queen, not even people who love each other, know what a single thing is. It is a great and wonderful mystery to all of us that anything is or that we are. And whether somebody says, I don't know how anything came to be, or God made everything, they are simply pointing to the feeling of the mystery of how everything is. But nobody knows what, what it really is or how it came to be. As long as we go on feeling this mystery, we feel free and full and happy, and we feel and act free and full and happy to others. This is the secret to being happy. From the time you are small until the time you are old. If you will remember every day to feel the mystery, and if you will remember to feel that you are more than what you look like, and if you remember to be the mystery itself, then you will be happy every day, and all kinds of wonderful happenings will come up for you. You will feel happy and you will always help and love others, even those who are having trouble feeling happy or are even trying to make you forget the mystery. Someday you may meet someone who has felt the mystery really strong for a long time, so that person feels the mystery all the time and is always happy. Such a person is the best person to learn from about happiness and life and love. I hope you will remember to feel the mystery every day, as long as you are awake forever. The best thing to tell anybody is to remember to feel this. I have been doing this for a long time, and it is the best and most important feeling of all. I am very happy I could tell you this. Maybe someday we will meet face to face. Maybe. Anyway, at least you and I will always know that at least one other person somewhere is remembering and feeling and loving the mystery right now. Thank you so much for your time and attention.